Hey everybody. Um, so now we're gonna get into chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really looking at um, the family dynamics, the family system, the family risks and resilience. So we know addiction is a family disease. Um, so when we look at family systems, we know it's composed of members who are in constant and dynamic interaction with one another. So the patterns of interaction are established, um, meaning who interacts with whom, uh, who talks and who listens, who has the authority in the family, uh, family patterns, uh, and any change in behavior of one member changes the whole impact um, on the family and the system as a whole. So when we look at addiction, um, we know that it impacts more than just the individual with the addiction. It impacts the whole family, um, and it's referred to as uh, a family disease. So in the book, the 10.1 is uh, a really good example uh, that it gives you. It's kind of a real life look on um, a, ch a child and she's eight years old, how a parent's addiction um, impacts that child and so on. And so due to the stigma of addiction, the family therapy field has had very little focus on addiction within the family. So in the 40s, the hypothesis was that it was faulty issues within the spouse. So for example, a wife of an alcoholic would be referred to psychotherapy. They would pin the blame of the husband's alcoholism, excuse me, alcoholism on her unconscious desire to keep her husband in some sort of inebriated state. So Murray Bowen um, in 1978 was able to expand his knowledge of family illness um, from his work with families who had children with schizophrenia. So he was able to focus on the key concepts um, of family communication and the mixed messages that are sent when you have a uh, somebody within the family that is struggling with addiction. So looking at the history of family treatment, so we know families often need as much treatment as the person uh, who is actually abusing the substance. So joint treatment of family members is needed to assist in recovery of all units. Um, so you can't just have the individual that's struggling with the addiction um, become well because there's still unhealthy members um, of the family because of those family dynamics that have grown accustomed to living with that addiction. Um, so unfortunately, we still see family blaming uh, for the person's addiction. So Virginia Satir, who's known for her family systems therapy um, and often called the mother of family therapy. Um, Claudia Black, who is an author, she was really influenced by um, Virginia Satir's studies, specifically her book that was titled, It Will Never Happen to Me. Um, and the formula that uh, she uses within the book um, you know, within alcoholic families that don't talk, that don't trust, that don't feel. Uh, so Claudia Black was able to expand on this and update this specific book to include other addictions, so not just alcohol, and actual issues pertaining to adult children. So it really integrated um, family therapy concepts and substance abuse treatment. So Al-Anon uh, was established in the 50s. Um, and to date has groups in more than 70 countries. So the purpose of Al-Anon um, is group support um, and really looking at independence uh, from the sick patterns of the individual. Um, it also helps alleviate the belief, belief that somehow um, the family is responsible for the ongoing addiction. All right. Wegscheider's role theory. Uh, so Sharon Wegscheider was influenced similarly like Claudia Black was with Virginia Satir's work. So it was introduced, she introduced a small kind of changing mobile. So really similar to those types of mobiles that go above a baby's crib. Um, so, so she used this to help present, represent the whole family interaction patterns as one piece of the mobile. So the whole apparatus moves. So that helped define roles that individual families play, actually reinforce or clash with roles of the other family members. So she observed roles that played out within these family. 
um, and was able to help identify some of the, uh, the different roles. So in your text on page 403, it really goes into depth on um, you know, the hero role, the scapegoat, the lost child, and the mascot. Um, those different roles that we see within families that have some sort of um, addiction. So I would suggest reading that and understanding some of those roles, specifically if you're going to be um, working in the substance use um, field. Also, when we look at mental health, um, when we've got somebody within a family that has some mental health issues, we also can see some of these um, family roles take place. So in the book titled Codependency No More, um, was actually written in the 80s, really popularized the term codependency. Uh, so the term, when you think of codependency, it really carried a lot of stress and blame for these families. Um, so it's not rooted with any sort of strengths perspective and really does more, fam more damage to um, label the family as codependent. So Hazleton, um, they've been around for quite some time. They are kind of one of the leaders within curriculum um, and different modalities in working with addiction. So the Hazleton Family Center actually disassociated itself from the codependency diagnosis um, as early as 1987. So really, they offered the suggestion to use terms such as survivor um, or the caring fam family member. So we look at family forms. Um, we show that when we have something really unhealthy, it's the enmeshed family. So spouses are estranged. We usually have one child that's enmeshed with father and one with mother. So you really see kind of this taking sides. Typically, children will do this for various reasons. Um, sometimes it's safety. Sometimes it's just making sure they're getting their needs met. Um, and sometimes it's manipulation on the parent's part. Um, through that child's development to have kind of this enmeshment, this really unhealthy pattern. So we then see families uh, that can be considered isolated. So there's really lack of any sort of cohesion within the family unit. Uh, there's lack of social support. Each member is really protected by this wall of defenses. They're not um, letting each other in. They're really kind of all on their own. Then when you see healthy families, so all are touching, as you notice, but boundaries are not overlapping. Everybody is able to maintain healthy boundaries, whether that be child, father, mother, um, they all have their own, and they're all equally respectful of each other's boundaries and don't um, overlap. So just like um, the stages of change that we have learned about um, and applied to the disease of addiction, um, it also can be used within um, the families, so the family unit. So it's also not uncommon uh, for various family members to be at very different stages of change. So when you look at the text, pages 408 through 412, go into greater detail about each of the stages of change within the context of the family unit. So just like we talked about pre-contemplation, um, you know, that's that kind of denial phase where there's nothing going on, there's nothing wrong with my family. Um, and that's really looking at the communication patterns within the family. And so trying to identify where are the roles, you know, who holds the power, who is speaking up, who's not speaking up. You know, then we go into the stage of contemplation so now families are noticing kind of some concerns and they might be looking for some solutions. So from there we move to preparation. So that's really that formal intervention um, and that kind of reaching out and getting help. So then we move into action, right? That is um, rehearsal and treatment of family uh, without the addicted member. So that's the family getting healthy on their own. Um, and then maintenance, really focus on, um, you know, not being your responsibility, but helping transition with sobriety. So when I look at cultural considerations, very, very important to take a client's um, cultural background in consideration. Um, so McGoldrick, uh, his book, he was able to identify different works with different um, cultures and populations. So we look at the Afro -Amer African American families, the reciprocity is a real big strength within that family unit. And then looking at working with Latino families, you wanna avoid the business-like approach. Um, so Asian and um, Asian American families, you really wanna engage with the most powerful person in the um, family 
And when we look at Appalachian family, so engage with the, um, the primary woman. She's going to help teach the healthcare practices. And you might say, mm, there's no Appalachian families here in Ohio. Um, that is not true. There is, you know, when we go down to southern Ohio and even eastern um, parts of Ohio have lots of Appalachian families. So when we look at situations of domestic violence. So we know there's that connection um, of substance use and violence. Um, so when we look at the situations, you have to know substance use does not create violence, right? That's not the excuse. I, I drink and so then I'm abusive. Um, absolutely not. The violence and those patterns are there before the substance use happens. Um, what may happen though is that somebody is using substances and it absolutely may intensify the abuse. Um, it's not the reason for the violence, uh, but we do know it will intensify it, um, especially when somebody is inebriated, you know, your decision-making skills are, are not quite there um, and all of the other things that, that go along with that. So um, when we look at these situations, it is not safe to refer or engage in any sort of couples counseling um, that is really an unsafe. Um, it puts whoever the victim is in a situation, um, really unsafe situation, where they're going to not be able to really hear what's going on in the home um, because then those are tactics that that abuser or batterer can ultimately um, use on them later. Uh, but what typically will happen is they're not going to say anything. Everything is great. Um, and then it's just a, a meaningless intervention. Um, if anything, like I said, it puts the, the victim in a lot um, more dangerous situation. And always, 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 um, if you know there's domestic violence um, going on within that home, the, the perpetrator, the batterer, should always be referred to a batter's intervention program. Okay, so that is looking at specifically that power and control of the violence. Uh, it's not enough just for this person to get sober and learn sobriety skills. Um, they then need to tackle uh, what's going on within their, their coping, their relationships, um, and why they're choosing to be violent on their intimate partners. So rules of fair fighting. So I'm just going to put this out there. This is not in the context of domestic violence families uh, or relationships, okay? So this is within uh, family units that violence is not present. So attacking the behavior, not the person, right? So if your uh, client is, is, is out drinking and, you know, they um, are spending all the money, so it's looking at the behavior, and not that person. So they're not a bad person, right? Not labeling them, but saying what you do, the behavior, that's what's that's what's uh, bad, that's what's uncalled for, because guess what? You can change behaviors, you can't change a person. And so keeping issues um, of manageable size, and once again, don't label, don't use negative labels, and don't rehash the past. So the three R's model, um, so that's really rename, reframe, and reclaim. So in your textbook, page 427, there's a case study uh, for Kathy and Ed. So I think it gives a really great perspective and will help you apply um, some of this information from this chapter to a real scenario. Um, it'll kind of make sense when you're kind of seeing it play out. So um, interventions, there's various treatment exercises that can be used when working with families. So once again, in your textbook, page 428 to 429, give further examples of these different interventions. Um, drawing family maps, you know, circles, you can have um, um, echo maps, eco maps, like looking at um, them and, and kind of within their environment. You definitely want to work on relapse prevention planning. You can always use uh, experts from, um, from a movie or a videotape. There's just lots of different um, treatment modalities and interventions that you can use with this population. So that wraps up chapter 10.